All right, good morning. Uh, I'm Sarah Flounders, and I know so many of the people who are gathered here today as anti-imperialist activists, organizers. I know you from my work in the UNAC and the International Action Center as a contributing editor to Workers' World newspaper and in the Sanctions Kill campaign and so many of you in defense committees and all kinds of past delegations and confrontations and street actions and all kinds of things. So this panel, and we probably won't have any room for Q&A, even if we all keep to our time limit, and we're gonna have to do that. But this conference, really, and this panel is hopefully a vehicle for navigating unchartered waters. That's what we're in today. We're in a seismic shift. There's an awaking radicalization that's happening on a global scale. And imperialism is drowning in its own arrogance and overreach. And like a drowning person, it's desperately trying to stay afloat, <coughs> use any measure, and more than willing to pull others down with them. Of all the developing crises, setbacks, and defeats confronting U.S. imperialism, and just think of the last three years, Afghanistan, and Syria, Ukraine, but it's the past six months in Gaza that is an upheaval beyond reckoning. It is an upheaval that's changing the world. And that's really what we want to look at. There's a global response. There's an identification with Gaza that confirms really the disintegrating position of US imperialism and its one strategic ally, Israel. That's who they have in all of Western Asia. And Zionism as a racist ideology of domination and colonialism is being challenged. It's a global turning point. October 7th was a revolutionary breakthrough that's how we should see it. It was a real changer. And the result is a world revolt. It's a world revolt against imperialism. When you see the millions, the billions who are in the streets, and we need to challenge ourselves and the movement here to defend the Palestinian resistance, to defend the right to resist, the right to liberation by any means necessary. That's what's at stake. This struggle is reshaping the world struggle. And the struggle in solidarity with the liberation of Palestine, it's part of the class struggle. It's a phenomenal breakthrough that's happening, even in organized labor here in the US regarding Palestine. When you look at the polls, when you look at the actions. Now, the Israeli war, and it is a war. It's all-out war against the Palestinians. Couldn't last a day without U.S. imperialism. And what's the result? Both Israel and the U.S. have become pariah states. Not a moment too soon. They're exposed. They're hated. And it's becoming really a material factor on the world scale. It's a period to ally ourselves with the liberation struggles of the whole global South and to mobilize workers here toward that objective. Now, UNAC exists as a coalition opposing all U.S. war, all regime change operations, all sanctions. They're all forms of imperialist war. It's what unites us. It's an essential unity right here in the center of the empire because the propaganda here is so intense. It confuses people, disorients them. They can support one struggle and can be completely on the other side in another one. We got to move that all the time. Now, UNAC began as a coalition 
united around the most difficult issue. There were people who walked out of a conference a little more than a decade ago over the demand, end all U.S. aid to Israel. That was a dividing line, and a dividing line that has been a uniting line. So, but now we're in a new day because for the first time, a majority of the U.S. population, when you look at any of the polls, is with Palestine. They may not understand all the issues we're raising here today, but in their heart, in their sympathy, they're for Palestine. You can't go anywhere. You can't get a cup of coffee without, if you mention Palestine, if you're wearing a keffiyeh, you're wearing a scarf, you're wearing a button, that you don't get a response. So this is a big change. Now, in polls today, there's another interesting thing happening, even if it's among people who understand nothing at all on Ukraine, about NATO. But nevertheless, they oppose more money for Ukraine, more money to NATO. Isn't that interesting? There is a breakthrough happening after three decades of NATO aggressive expansion, and it's been silent. And two years now and two months of NATO determination to impose regime change on Russia. Well, how did that go? Biden promised within weeks he would turn the ruble, the Russian ruble, into rubble. He would impose sanctions so extreme and all pervasive. And the U.S. and NATO demanded every other country in the world comply. That's not what happened. The global south, in Asia, in Africa, in Latin America, didn't comply. There have been tens of billions of dollars to prop up the fascist regime in Ukraine. And it's a total loss. The front lines are crumbling. So there are big changes happening that we need to really understand. U.S. sanctions are no longer the all-powerful weapon. The dollar, the almighty dollar, is in decline. The ruble and the rupee and the Chinese yuan, they are now major currencies of trade. U.S. sanctions had grown to 40 countries. So most extreme form is what is happening in Gaza, but it's their plan for every country. They want to starve down anyone who resists them. And now the sanctions are challenged by the growing influence of the global south, who are developing new communications, new trade. There's an expanding BRICS alliance that should keep U.S. imperialism up at night. And a Belt and Road development projects involving 140 countries. There are new ways of financing development that don't leave countries totally chained to the IMF and the World Bank and their demands for privatization and handover of resources and cuts, cuts, cuts in essential subsidies. There's huge changes sweeping Africa, especially in the Sahel. Niger demanded French troops out, and just this week, U.S. troops and that drone base out of Niger. That's enormous. And in Mali, and Burkina Faso, and Guinea, and now in Senegal, just this week. Uh, and there's an anti-colonial upheaval, a real upheaval. Now, who does the U.S. feel is responsible for this ability to defy their demands? Who are they angriest at? Who do they say is the cause of all this? Now, they, they blame Iran, yes. They blame Russia, yes. But it's really focused on China. It is. And all the big guns are trained on China. It's the sanctions. It's the aircraft carriers. It's the new weapons to Taiwan. That's the new U.S. strategic partner. What Israel is, that's what the U.S. wants to do with Taiwan. They've made it a porcupine, as they call it, bristling with so many weapons. There's the charges of a genocide against the Uyghur Muslims in Xinjiang. 
Now, that's a charge that every Muslim country in the world has countered and denounced. It's interesting. They won't say genocide in Gaza, but they'll tell you there's a genocide going on in Xinjiang, and there's no Muslim country that accepts that. We could look at the arming and positioning in South Korea and Asia Pacific. U.S. economic dominance now is in the past, and its global position is past tense, but it is the largest military in history, and we have to take that capacity for unrestrained destruction very seriously, very seriously. And that's where the mass movement comes in. That is the only thing on a global scale. I'm going to try to wind up on this because we have a whole panel and we have some workshops right after this that really will be discussing this further. <coughs> but how far is the U.S. willing to go to defend its deteriorating global position? We can see it when Israel is publicly bulldozing bodies in plain sight, bombing diplomatic and consular facilities, a desperate effort to pull Iran into the war, and the targeting of workers from relief organizations. Gaza confirms how far the U.S. is willing to go in its war, in its destruction, in its attempted starvation of a whole people. It's a new normalization in imperialist war. Israel is flaunting its ability to just break through every known line of international humanitarian law and get away with it because they have the U.S. at their back. And it's no different also as Ukrainian forces are bombing deeper into Russia and using proxies to hit a concert hall in Russia. It's U.S. efforts at destabilization everywhere in the world. They don't have to be an alternative. They just want to create destruction, division, war, everywhere they can. It's a sign of their desperation. We need to look at the really vicious, renewed, and more intense blockade of Cuba, harsher than any previous time, the deadly threats against Venezuela. Around the elections that are coming up, they have a whole game plan on how to disrupt. U.S. appears positioned to go into Haiti because they can't get any other country to take it on. And this imperialist alliance of the U.S. and Canada, the EU, and Britain the whole NATO gang is increasingly ex exposed, unable to impose its will, to pay for it, to pay for endless war on every continent. They're willing to grab back every concession that the workers have won in the U.S. and in the imperialist countries. It's getting pretty brutal. It will get much worse. And this is, again, where we come in, making those links against the wars everywhere and the war happening right here. So we need unity against all U.S. wars. We need to have a global view. We need to know that imperialism is a threat to humanity, that unity and resistance is our message, that the power is in the people. And when we look at the port closers and the street closings and the sit-ins and the shutdowns, we need to support the resistance right here. It may take a more radical turn that's important to know. And not, we have to not break with the militants who are just learning that the power is in the people, just learning what it takes to organize a shutdown, a breakthrough, a sit-in. These actions, because that's power, it's being criminalized in Gaza, it's being criminalized here in all kinds of firings and doxings and site closings and arrests. And we need to applaud and support those who are in the front line of this battle, not break with the militants, support and understand them, not say, oh, this is too far, this is not what we planned. No, we need to know it's a new form of power emerging right here. It will be through many experiences. We need to be with it at every possible event and day and applaud and support those who are in this battle. That's people power. People power. The power is in the people, and we say power to the people, and join me in saying people power. People power. People power. All right.
So, <coughs> I'm going to introduce the next speaker on this panel, who is William Kamakaro, knows a lot about people power and has really been on some front lines He's with the Bolivar and Circle, really played an incredible role in the campaign to free Alex Saab. He's now home with his family in Venezuela. He has <laughs> one real win this year. Uh, and the continuing delegations to Venezuela. I think he's also just been in Peru and Bolivia, many places. So, William, let me turn this over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Sarah. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I just came back from Venezuela. I was uh, around two years outside the United States spending my time in Venezuela, uh, Bolivia, and a certain amount of time in Peru. Um, it really was a little hard to come back to the United States, <laughs> especially when you think in everything that's going on now here, and when you see who is the president of the United States, the, I'm sorry to say, but it's a piece of shit. Um, is someone that is very hard and difficult to respect. Um, anyway, I was able to see certain things that are very interesting. The crisis that Bolivia is living right now is very serious. We need to try to see how we can help them to overcome this uh, situation they are living. They are fighting among themselves. They are dividing the movement. And the right wing is taking advantage of the situation, especially people from Santa Cruz. Oh, those right wing guys, they also are putting a lot of money to devalue the currency. And this is something that was, you will see soon. Uh, you will see people, uh, right-wing people demonstrating in Santa Cruz and almost every day in the main square, this September 17th square, and with a picture of Camacho and the former president, you know, the fake president of Bolivia, uh, Añez, and, and a bunch of other people that they say that were killed by Evo Morales, by Arce, Choquehuanca, and they are accusing them of human rights violation. So they said that they would take power. In the meantime, we had this fight inside of the mass, the party that is ruling the country. It's very bad, very sad, that situation. So we, we also had, I was able to go to Peru briefly and see how the movement and angry of the people, again, the dictatorship that's taking place there, uh, so many people have been killed. Uh, so many people have, are in prison without any crime. Uh, even the, pres the former president, or the president, still is the president, Pedro Castillo, is in prison. Um, and also, uh, so, uh, you know, they, they use any excuse to incarcerate anyone. Uh, they just, uh, there was a huge, huge uh, demonstration in Machu Picchu for more than two months, I'm very sure that you didn't know that, because uh, they, they wanted to privatize Machu Picchu, and the indigenous people were protesting against that. Also, um, there are other heritage sites that they want to privatize in Peru, and, so, and the indigenous people are mobilizing against those possibilities, and several people are fighting against those privatizations Privacy, I'm, 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 I'm sorry. Pravi, again, the possibility to privatize those places are getting death threats right now. So that's the situation in Peru. Well, the Argentina is something that's all over, so people know what's going on there. But uh, something funny that's taking place now is that the economy in Bolivia is much better, and some Argentinian people are moving to Bolivia now. And, and then Ecuador, that is a mess, a very horrible mess, uh, narco traffic, 
paramilitaries and several USA bases. And Peru also, they are opening several military bases. Uh, and, and, and also, in the same thing in Peru and Ecuador, they are opening all the, mine, uh, all the mines to the USA corporation interests. So they, can, uh, they are doing whatever they want there right now. Um, uh, and well, you know, maybe you know already the big news that the vice, former vice president of Korea was in, in the embassy of Mexico and he was basically kidnapped from the embassy by Ecuadorian government. So they in, basically invaded the embassy. So, so completely illegal. We had that, those horrible situations. Meanwhile, we see what's going on, for example, in Haiti. That is horrible. It's a hell. What's going there? Going there. I, I want just to, to say something. Haiti, you know, Haitian people are not poor. In fact, Haitians have been impoverished by more than a one, more than 100 years by USA uh, interventions. The reality is that the Haitian, they have, for example, uh, they have gold, they have um, uranium, they have iridium, and they have oil. We don't know the amount of resources that they have. That little tiny part of the Española, how much resources have, but we know that United States don't want them to have an army. It's curious, no? Just a few days ago, uh, President Maduro was talking and saying that Ma uh, he was very close to Martine Martinelli, and, and Prevale. Prevale was his name? So these two presidents, basically, both of them approach one to President Chavez and the other one to President Maduro, requesting them to open, to help them to rebuild an army. And then they went back to Venezuela. They spoke to first to Chavez, then to Maduro, and say, "Hey, we cannot do that. We are getting death threat from the United States." So they were unable to do it. So. And we know, we know what they want. Basically, Laura Richardson, the USA, uh, the USA Southern Commander Chief, talking in the national TV, talking all over, she said, you have gold. Remember that? You have lithium. You have uh, water, forests. You have all those resources. She didn't say you have a culture. You have a history. You have a nice people. No, you have resources, and that's what they are looking for. Right now, we are in an election in Venezuela that is very threatening. President Chavez, sorry, Chavez is still present, <laughs> but pr President Maduro has received, in uh, uh, this year, three assassination attempts. So, and he's, it's very difficult for him to do uh, campaign, to campaign when, you know, basically they want him to kill him. They are requesting 50 million for his head. So it's extremely difficult to do an election in those conditions. However, United States is saying, hey, we want clean, transparent elections. But you have to run with that threat you have to run with sanctions. You have to run with all these difficult conditions. I just want to say, just to finish, I want to mention, um, I think I have it here. I don't know where I have it. Roy Brown is a singer, a, polit a political singer from Puerto Rico. And basically, he said, the war is on fire. Who put the war in fire? The Yankees, no? And he said, the Yankees want fire. So let's give them fire. Thank you.
Thank you, William. Next up, we have Jeff Mackler of Socialist Action. He's on the Administrative Committee of UNAC and the West Coast Free Julian Assange Campaign, Free Momia Campaign. Jeff Mackler. I must say that I am impressed with every single one of the last speakers. I compare their political analysis from when I came into the movement 65 years ago fighting the U.S. slaughter in Vietnam, and every one of them had a more sophisticated understanding of the nature of the beast. Let me begin in 1898 when King Leopold of Belgium enslaved the people of the Congo and slaughtered 12 million people in the largest genocide in the history of the world. He ended up with the gold in the Congo and the, excuse me, the rubber and the ivory in the Congo, but guess who ended up with the natural resources? Rockefeller and J.P. Morgan, and they still own it today. That tells you about the nature of the beast. The U.S. imperialist monstrosity maintains 1,100 military bases in 110 countries outside of the United States. We are foreclosing every single one of them. They are up to no good other than the exploitation by monopoly capital of the peoples of the world, and we say, bring them home now. The United States maintains a national security apparatus with five million paid certified, national security certified agents that operate around the world in 13 different agencies, including the CIA. I am for abolishing the entire national security apparatus of this government. The United States rules with open intervention, covert intervention, drone wars, assassination wars, special operation wars, sanction wars, embargo wars, and blockade wars against any dissident nation that chooses to exercise its own self-determination. I say, end it all, bring it all home. In 2014, the United States engineered, financed, and banked a fascist-led coup in Ukraine that overthrew the elected government of that country, abolished the elected parliament, and appointed a majority mem uh, to the parliament of non-elected fascist leaders and ordered them on first day to ban the Russian language and march on the eastern Ukraine to slaughter anyone who resisted the coup. And there were people who resisted, and I say more power to them. When Russia invaded Ukraine, it was not before the United States and NATO rebuilt the Ukrainian army and amassed 250,000 troops on the border prepared to slaughter the Russian-speaking people, 14,000 of them who, who they already murdered in their fascist-led regime. And today there are one million Russian-speaking Ukrainian refugees that had to flee to Russia to save their lives. The United States orchestrated the 10-year war, the Iran-Iraq war that killed one that killed two million people in order to destroy the oil resources of both countries because the Iranians had the guts to organize a revolution that ended U.S. corporate control of their oil, the richest oil reserves in the world. And when they resisted, the United States orchestrated a 10-year war against both nations, and at that time, they used Saddam Hussein as their agent. The United States orchestrated two coups in Venezuela. 
They orchestrated a coup in Bolivia that overthrew the elected government in order to steal the lithium. In Venezuela, they were interested in the second largest oil reserves in the world. They killed two million in Afghanistan because they wanted its natural resources. The United States, all of this was done in the interest of finance, monopoly, capitalism, and every single one of these wars was bipartisan, orchestrated by the Democrats and Republicans who unanimously approved every military budget, including the latest one, all told a trillion dollars a year for death and destruction in their bipartisan wars. In, in Vietnam, they killed four million people and it took a united front, mass action, mobilization in the U.S. and worldwide to bring the troops home now and create a political climate to challenge the capitalist beast. Once again, I say, united front, democratic, mass action is our middle name, and UNAC is the sterling example of it. The United States butchers back the Sub-Moser regime in Nicaragua that slaughtered 50,000 people. They backed the Batista regime in Cuba that killed tens of thousands of people. NATO, the United States, and its allies in the Gulf state mon monarchy on trumped-up charges invaded Libya and reduced one of the most advanced technological countries to abject poverty. In the United States, they tried to organize a coup and kill 500,000 Syrians. 500,000 Syrians. And guess who sits on Syria's oil today? American Imperialist Corporation. I am for the abolition of the U.S. military. I am for the ab... I am for the abolition of NATO the abolition of Africa. But as national secretary of my political party, and I'm also the director of the mobilization to free Mumia Abu-Jamal, and I have to say, I've spent 40 years freeing Mumia, a revolutionary framed up by the criminal injustice, racist system that incarcerates more people on this planet than any nation on earth, a higher percentage. Let me be frank. If we are going to challenge this system, we need a movement like we see emerging today, but qualitatively larger with deep roots in every single struggle, <clears throat> a movement led by the magnificent youth who attended this conference today, an independent movement that is not subordinate to the Democratic and Republican parties. Tragically, that movement for Black Lives Matter went into the Biden campaign only to see him spend additional tens of millions and billions on the cop violence in the United States that murders on average two unarmed blacks every single day and never a police or rarely ever is a police prosecuted. So I am against any support to all capitalist parties. They are all for profit. They are all supporters of imperialism. They all invent pretext, as with every country I mention, to invade in order to advance the interests of the capitalist monopolies who profit by bleeding the American working class. I am, in addition to a partisan and founder of UNEC's administrative committee, an attendee of every UNEC conference. I'm a revolutionary socialist, and we need a socialist revolution to put an end to this sick system. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Next up, we're going to hear from Tom Baker, who's here from Canada, president of the Local Riding Association of the Ontario National Democratic Party in Canada and the Socialist Caucus of the NDP. Tom Baker. Thank you. 
thanks for the opportunity to be part of this amazing panel and this event. This is the first time I've been here. Our organization is part of you, found, found, was a founding organization with UNAC, but I haven't been able to get down here. So I'm from uh, Canada, from uh, uh, near Toronto, Hamilton, Ontario, I'm part of the Hamilton Coalition to Stop the War. I want to share a few words with you on Canada's foreign policy uh, as it relates to uh, NATO, in particular to the, to the Ukraine. Um, and if time, I, I'd like to sp make a few comments about the pro-war stance of Canada's New Democratic Party, which is, uh, is a trade union-based mass labor party. Can Canadian forces' roots go back to the British force that brutally dispossessed the First Nations in uh, Canada, or what is now called Canada. After Confederation, the new Canadian military served to suppress Métis and Indigenous peoples in the West and to quell labor unrest. So that's the roots of the Canadian Armed Forces, uh, United Forces, I guess they're called. Between, besides the two world wars, the Canadian Forces has a rich history of gunboat diplomacy and special forces deployments around the world. Canadian Forces have had active engagement in Korea, Sudan, South Africa, Iraq, Serbia, Afghanistan, and Libya partnering with their, their, their twins, the U.S. imperialists. Canada has played key roles in regime changes and coups through aid withdrawal, sanctions, and supporting unpopular opposition groups. Canadian forces have participated in the ouster of some 22 elected governments, uh, primarily in Latin America and Africa, most recently Haiti, 2004, Ukraine, 2014, and, and Venezuela just a few examples. As NATO celebrates its 75th birthday of endless pro-imperialist wars, it's worth noting that it was the United States, UK, and Canada that first met privately in 1948 uh, to discuss the founding of NATO. Its original purpose was to restrict, intimidate, and contain the Soviet Union and its allies. <clears throat> Today, our government leaders proudly boast of their participation and contribution to every NATO mission, operation, and activity since NATO's founding. It's uh, not something a lot of us uh, are proud of, that's for sure. Our leaders seem to be proud of it. Canada supported expanding NATO at the end of the Cold War, despite promises that have been made to the Soviet Union in terms of NATO not moving eastward. Without as much as a debate, in Parliament, Canada was the first NATO country to approve the enlargement of the alliance in 1998. Canada has continued to push NATO expansion, including incorporation of Ukraine eventually. Canada has the sixth largest defense budget in NATO. Um, I'm not going to bore you with all the numbers because they pale so <laughs> in comparison to the U.S. budget dollars. <laughs> not worth saying, really. Um, U.S. wants us to uh, wants all NATO members, as you probably know, to spend 2% of their GDP on, on military. We, we haven't quite got there. We're only at 1.2%, and I don't think in the crisis, our economic crisis Canada's in, that we're likely to advance on that too much. Hopefully not. Um, we just purchased uh, 88 F-35 Lockheed uh, jet fighters, and uh, a lot of us, there's been a big campaign to fight that but it's been approved recently. It's going to cost the taxpayers $19 billion uh, for these killing machines. Now, our military budget is four times that of the funds that we devote to international aid and diplomacy. It gives you kind of an idea of the balance. I want to talk a little bit more about the Ukraine. Canada has significantly contributed to the instability and unpredictability in the Ukraine, which resulted over the years in the eventual provocation of Russia. Canada was a close ally of the United Kingdom and the United States in the overthrow of the Ukraine's democratically elected government in 2019. After the U.S. hand-picked regime was installed, Canadian Special Forces joined the British SAS and U.S. forces on the ground to begin the transformation of the Ukrainian military. Canada has participated in weapons shipments, intelligence gathering, the creation of massive amounts of misinformation and censoring of the news to foster a false consensus in support of U.S. and NATO war aims. Just briefly, uh, the New Democratic 
party in Canada, as I mentioned, is Canada's Labour Party. Uh, it unfortunately, um, like all the other political parties, capitalist political parties in Canada, is a, a pro-war, anti-Russian agenda. Uh, and uh, they've supported Canada, unabashedly supported the Canadian government's aggressive role in the Ukraine supporting NATO. NDP, shamefully, has supported NATO missions in the Baltic region, the bombing of Serbia and Libya, and as I mentioned, strongly supports Ukraine's bid for NATO. Historically, inside the New Democratic Party, there are leftist forces, believe it or not, there for different reasons, some who think they can reform the party, perhaps. Uh, Socialist Action, Socialist Caucus, we're in there to try to throw out the leaders of that disgusting party and uh, try to build a real socialist party, uh, but uh, that's uh, not an easy task. However, uh, you know, the party has never even allowed a debate in its entire history on NATO. And it hasn't always been pro-NATO in those early days uh, when it was connected to the farmers' movements, and the, um, it did have a, an anti-NATO position briefly. But they won't even allow a debate to take place on the conventions. You can't get a resolution on NATO, on the convention. NATO diverts resources, just to wrap up here, NATO diverts resources from climate action, housing, health care, and education. I mean, there's only a limited amount of... Uh, government budget, and unfortunately, those are the areas that suffer when we waste money on fighter jets. Socialists work, as I mentioned, inside the NDP and within the trade union movement, demanding that the leaders call for an immediate ceasefire, urge negotiations for peace in the Ukraine. No more weapons to Ukraine. Self-determination for the oblasts in East Ukraine. Our uh, Hamilton Coalition to Stop the War has organized many lo uh, demonstrations and educational events demanding Canada out of NATO. And there is an increasing sympathy for that position. I th it's certainly not like the demonstrations we see uh, in defense of the Palestinian resistance, but um, it is starting. Uh, most recently, um, this, uh, our, our work is focused on opposition to what we call NATO's proxy war in the Ukraine. Um, we demand NATO out of the Ukraine, disbanding of NATO, uh, the, and the criminal syndicate of the corporate rulers who profit from war. Thank you. Thank you, Tom Baker. Uh, well, we've gone north to Canada, and now I think we're going straight into space. Uh, Bruce Gagnon, who is with the Global Network Against Weapons and Nuclear Power in Space. Bruce produces quite a bit of material on U.S. weapons, U.S. bases, U.S. drones. Bruce Gagnon. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. It's great to be with you today. The Global Network was created in 1992 to prevent the arms race from moving into space. All warfare on the planet today is coordinated by space technology. With space satellites, you can see everything, you can hear everything, and you can target every place on the Earth. So in lower Earth orbit, the United States is and its allies are trying to fill up the orbit with their military satellites before Russia and China can get there. Russia only has about 250 military satellites today, while the United States, with the help of Elon Musk, has literally tens of thousands of them. So the idea, it's like a crowded uh, supermarket parking lot. Fill up the parking lot as quickly as possible. So the U.S. today is going around the world and getting the allies to help build more mini-satellites and launch more mini-satellites so that we, the Western allies, they say, will be able to control space, dominate space, and deny access to other nations. This is creating, obviously, serious tensions. But again, the U.S. 
can't afford to do this program itself. We're $35 trillion in debt here, so the allies are being rounded up. Last end of February, I was invited to go to Korea to do a 10-day, eight-city speaking tour about space. The reason is because the United States is dragging South Korea now into this program. So I want to share with you some of the things that I witnessed while I was there. In Jeju Island, you might have heard of it, a, a beautiful uh, island just off the mainland of, of South Korea, has uh, uh, long been opposing the development of a Navy base in their community for U.S. warships as part of the pivot, the U.S. pivot to move its forces into the Asia-Pacific region. And for more than 10 years, the Global Network has been working with the people on Jeju Island. Well, because of that relationship, they understand about the space issue. And they invited me to come because their island is now being turned into a space warfare base. There's a big weapons corporation in South Korea called Hanwha. And they're now building a space center on Jeju Island. They're building a satellite production factory on Jeju Island. And they're also building a launch facility on Jeju Island. So Jeju Island now becomes a super target in any war with China. While on that trip, I went to the city of Piantec. Piantec has a US, Army Air, a US Army base called Camp Humphreys. There was an Army base in Seoul, in the capital, called Yongsan. And Yongsan, over the many years since the Korean War, has polluted the living hell out of Seoul, especially the water. And the people wanted that base out of there. Plus, it was closer to North Korea and was an obvious target in a war. So the U.S. has moved Yongsan Army Base down to an existing base called Camp Humphreys. And for 10 years, 71 farming villages surrounding Camp Humphreys fought against the U.S. plan to steal their land to expand the Camp Humphreys base. And after 10 years, the United States, with its uh, client uh, state in, in uh, South Korea, the government, was successful in, in getting rid of those 71 villages. It's just a tragedy. And now those lands are being contaminated by this massive base in Piantec. Also in Piantec, there's a U.S. Air Force base called Osan, and there the United States created its first overseas Space Force unit. You know, during the Trump administration in 2020, Space Force was created as a new military uh, 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 service, just like the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, the Marines, so now Space Force is going around the world and beginning to create Space Force units in the allied countries. So now at uh, Osan Air Force Base, Space Force unit is being uh, developed. Then I went to Kusan, Kunsan Air Force Base. I had visited this place years ago. I had visited a fishing village right on the outskirts of Kunsan Air Force Base, a US base. But now that fishing village, when I return this time, is gone. It's been destroyed. And in its place, on an endangered wetlands, wildlife preserve, where really rare birds uh, live and flourish, the United States is planning to build a new runway. Because again, in this pivot, you need more ports of call for your warships, you need more runways for your warplanes, you need more barracks for your troops, etc., etc., etc. So this fishing village is gone now, and this new runway is planned to destroy this wetlands area. I was taken to a very small farming village called Unwa, and recently a cluster bomb factory has been built there for the United States. Unwa is very frightened about this because previously this cluster bomb factory had been in another village. 
but the dynamite there, the TNT, blew up and started a massive fire, burned down the factory, and burned the existing mountains around this uh, village. Well, Unwa has mountains around its village, and now they have a new factory where TNT is being stored, and they're frightened to death that this is the same kind of explosion and fire is going to happen to them. I asked the question, where do these cluster bombs go when they're, after they're being built? And they said the U.S. gives them to Ukraine and Israel. So what we see here, the United States is literally hollowing out the South Korean economy and militarizing it just the way our own country is being militarized and just the way we see Europe today under NATO being militarized in, in order to build more war machines for this NATO war expansion game. So whether it's Japan or the islands off of Japan, Okinawa or in Guam, the Solomon Islands, Australia, New Zealand, all across the Asia Pacific, the United States is militarizing this region, turning all these places into war machines, bases, and, and ultimately targets in a war. On March 22nd, just a couple weeks ago, I joined a protest at Elbit Systems, an Israeli-owned military production facility in the town of Merrimack, New Hampshire. We arrived there at 6 o'clock in the morning before the workers had started to come in, and we blocked the entrance to this military production facility. Eight of, eight of us were, were arrested that day. Six of us came from Maine and the other two from New Hampshire. And the, the place uh, was closed down till at least 11 o'clock. I was arrested at 6.20 a.m., the first to be, to be arrested. And it's interesting, though, because we apparently got people's attention. Because the governor, the right-wing governor of New Hampshire, Sununu, whose father had previously been the governor, tweeted out that this was an anti-Semitic protest in Merrimack, New Hampshire, and that New Hampshire government was going to uh, enforce the law to the letter to prosecute these people who had uh, closed down Elbit Systems for a day. Well, I wonder, did Israel say to Governor Sununu that you either nip these protests in the bud or we're going to move somewhere else? Because we know in the UK recently, Elbit closed down one of their factories there because of continued protests. So our message to Governor Sununu and the people of New Hampshire is we're not giving up. And in fact, we're encouraging people around the country. There's other Elbit and uh, Elbit subsidiaries that are building weapons for Israel around this country of ours. We need to expand this campaign to shut down Elbit, an Israeli military production facility inside of our own country, using our own workers and our own resources on our own land to commit this genocide in, in Palestine. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Bruce Gagnon. Right, we're moving from U.S. military plans to who's the next big target. We're going to be discussing China, the pivot to Asia. And first up, I want to call on Michael Wong, who's the past vice president of Veterans for Peace. Uh, he plays an important role in the Veterans for Peace China Working Group. Really, he co coordinates that. I want to say I'm proud to be part of that, producing a lot of new material uh, explaining China, and he's also um, part of the Pivot to Peace. Michael Wong. Thank you. 
Let me just start out on a little personal note. Uh, there's at least three people here who refused orders to Vietnam back during that war. Maybe more that I don't know about, but let me just introduce Jerry Condon. Would you please stand? Former U.S. Army Special Forces, refused orders to Vietnam, deserted to Sweden and then Canada. Uh, D. Knight, please stand. He refused the draft and went to Canada and also he has his books out here. You can take a look at them. And I also was in the U.S. Army and refused orders to Vietnam and deserted to Canada. If there's anybody else in the room who did so, please stand. Oh. Thank you. Okay, we have two more speakers in China who are going to discuss different aspects of China. What I would like to do is start out by debunking the propaganda against China. You'll hear a lot of accusations about human rights and freedom and democracy and how it doesn't exist in China. Let me debunk a couple of the prime examples. First is Hong Kong. In 2019 and 2020, there was an uprising in Hong Kong and the US media and the US government and our allies said these are peaceful protests against Chinese authoritarianism and against a national security law it was going to deport people to mainland China where they can be tried and disappeared. The truth is, this all started when one young man and his girlfriend, who was pregnant, from Hong Kong, went to visit Taiwan on vacation. They got in an argument, and the boyfriend killed his girlfriend, chopped her body up into pieces, hid it in a suitcase, and hightailed it back to Hong Kong. There's no extradition treaty between Hong Kong and the government on Taiwan. So when he tried to, so when his girlfriend failed to return and the mother reported it, the Taiwan police investigated, they found the suitcase, they found the body. The Hong Kong police interrogated the person, he confessed, and uh, they wanted to deport him to Taiwan for trial, since that's where the crime occurred. Taiwan authorities refused to accept that, and because there was no extradition treaty, there was no law that could force that extradition to take place. Hong Kong then tried to form a law that was very specific, that it only applied to crimes that were crimes in both places, that were serious enough to have at least five years in, in prison, that were non-political, that had to be uh, passed through the Hong Kong uh, criminal system first, which was still run under the, the, the same system as under the British, and then it had to be verified by the chief administrator of Hong Kong before the deportion could take place. That's what the protesters rose up against. And what happened was the NED, the National Endowment for Democracy, a CIA offshoot, had been pouring millions of dollars for years into Hong Kong to train people to rise up against the government. The Hong Kong education system was still the same British system with the same British teachers who basically taught British values, British history, and British propaganda. So all these youth were organized by US agents who had been trained in subversion uh, in other countries as well as Hong Kong. And they started off with a riot that thrash the Hong Kong legislative office that did a lot of destruction and then they went on to attack the police. 
They were using clubs, they were throwing bricks, they were throwing Molotov cocktails, which they called firebombs, at the police. In the United States, if you threw a Molotov cocktail at a police officer, you'd be shot on the spot. There wouldn't be any trial. You'd be dead. The Hong Kong police shot one, in a, in, a, in a whole year of this, the Hong Kong police shot one person in the shoulder and one person in the leg. They killed nobody. These people were thrashing stores that they thought were pro-government. They were setting fires in subway stations and thrashing the fire sta the f thrashing the fire stations, I mean the subway stations, just breaking them up into p literally into pieces, tearing up pieces of roads and throwing bricks from the roads at people. They killed one senior citizen who was trying to clean up the street with a brick. Um, they set one man on fire who was arguing with them by pouring gasoline on him and lighting him in a fire. They caught one reporter from the mainland, tortured him for hours. He later committed suicide. So this is the kind of violent protest that went on for a whole year. And yet, the police killed no one. People who were arrested throwing Molotov cocktails, they got six years in prison. If you compare that to January 6th in Washington, D.C., people who did not commit any acts of violence but were highlighted as leaders, some of them got 18 years in prison. That was one day in January 6th in Washington compared to one year in Hong Kong. Let me move on to Xinjiang. In Xinjiang, there was a, um, well, I don't know, a, a guerrilla war basically started by an insurgency started by uh, Uyghur people, some of whom had fought with Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan against the Russians and then Afterwards, the CIA sent them to China in Xinjiang to start a Muslim uprising there. They had weapons, they had, experience, they had combat experience and training, they had support, and they had mountain hideouts similar to Tora Bora. They staged a long campaign of terrorism that involved hundreds of incidents, hundreds of people being killed, and the Chinese army eventually had to attack the strongholds, the caves, and take them out. And then what they had to do was deal with the hundreds of supporters that they had. And what they did, rather than doing what the United States does, which would be a drone strike, they put them in re-education programs that involved not only political indoctrination, but also job training, job skills. These programs lasted six months to a year on average, and then, they, and then if they were willing to reform, they were placed in jobs uh, related to whatever their job training was. These are the camps the concentration camps that the United States was talking about. So you're, 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 you're saying that compared to a drone strike, these people were being re-educated to become normal citizens. The U.S. might call that brainwashing. But if you take a terrorist and brainwash them into being a normal citizen and leading a normal life, is that preferable to a drone strike? I'll leave it there. So there's a lot of things that go on like this. These are just two examples. There are many more. But when you hear people tell you that it's democracy versus authoritarianism, tell them no. It's American imperialism versus national liberation. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you, Michael Wong. That's true, a war resistor, 1960s and 70s, right up to today. We're next going to hear from Lee Su Hin with the China-U.S. Solidarity Network, the National Immigrant Solidarity Network. He's back and forth between China and the U.S. and recently China to Cairo. Organizes actually people's um, delegations and tours to China, trying to explain China today. So, Li Su Hin. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Sarah Frondos. Thank you for the conference inviting me coming to speak today. I know a little bit tired and lunch is coming, so I want to make a short chant. Read after me. No war on Asia. No war on Asia. No war on China. No war on China. Free, free Palestine. Free, free Palestine. Thank you. My name is Li Su Hin, Li Xiaoxuan. I'm the national coordinator of the National Immigrant Solidarity Network and China US Solidarity Network is an unpaid organizer. I'm also also was a former undocumented special worker in this country that struggled under the to total below no one knows what we are doing. That's why we rise up to fight against the injustice, to fight against the imperialism, fight against the capitalism. I had been troubled back and forth besides the immigrants' rights works we've been doing since 2000s, the anti-war social justice movement since 1980s, and also uh, we also have been put involved in the Vietnam War, I believe or not, I'm old enough to involve in Vietnam War. And uh, also the China saw that this since 2010, for different reasons. Because the struggle never stopped. The injustice never sleeps. That's the reason our struggle never ends. Because the, this topic today is what we're talking about, uh, this panel is about uh, unities and also the, about the current situation. So I'm just going to say very specific on this area. I work trouble between China and US frequently. Three days ago, I just back from China. Two weeks ago, I was in, I've just returned from Egypt for supporting the Palestinian struggles as well as the Solidarity work between China and U.S. I do medical works between here in U.S. and also in China to, to build a people's movement. Gaza, the Palestine, I can comfortably, I can firmly speak, 90% of Chinese public support the resistance, support the struggle in Gaza. That's a fact, 90%. But what I worry about is yet, most of the American of peace and justice circle in this country never met with them, didn't know about that. How many people use TikTok here? Great, uh, it's less than I thought, but that's good. Uh, <laughs> There's a, as you know, probably there's a, so such as a TikTok China side and TikTok global side, so it's not connected, and I have both accounts. And in TikTok China side, overwhelming majority, 99% of the message on Palestine has been really positive, support the resistance. Also, that almost every blogger I met in the TikTok China side has been supporting the, the fight against the racism, the justice for... Uh, indigenous people and also the black liberation movement. So that is a message that is very positive. <laughs> Yet, I think that most people here never met. That's the reason we want to work building a bridge between not only China, but Russia and other countries developing global south to build, to have a chance to talk, to meet and build, to, to build a common ground we can fight for together. 
for common social issues. I think that one of, uh, also what I worry about a lot is because I think that that's not happening yet. That's not happening yet. I feel, uh, this meeting, I've been, I'm, people have been uh, pausing all the time, and that's great. I I'm really uh, feel positive. But that's the one pause I thought that less, the least people have been abhorring was talking about Xinjiang issues. As my work, as my medical works, as my solidarity works in China, I've been in Xinjiang for a dozen times. I personally know people. I've been traveled from north to south, east to west, and met with hundreds of people, include the farmers, workers, government officials, intellectuals, and also the so-called former uh, the training camps uh, people. So I know very, very well what's happening there. So make a long story short, there's no such thing as a concentration camp. There's no such thing as a human rights violation because what's happening is the reality is what U.S. has all these biggest prison in the world and also the exploitation and police brutality and killing the people of color every day and that is not right. <laughs> what I worry about is because the, the justice movement here in this time, the latest, the Gaza's the issue of what happened in the past time. Although it's a very small number, although it's a very tiny number, which is I, uh, there's been some people want to use uh, linking the struggle in Gaza to linking the so-called uh, the issue in Xinjiang. Ooh, I want that not to happen because that is uh, uh, going to dilute, going to move our attention to other issues and they're going to break our movement, break our solidarity. Another thing is, how we can, uh, because the time is getting short, I want to be a few things I want to, to, to say. Number one, not only work with us, but the hopefully we can find a way we can build a, a true people to people dem diplomacy that between not only China, as I said, other countries from Vietnam to all this country in Russia, that we can work with uh, the people that work with. Uh, 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 American or European activists together for the common struggles. I always want to bring uh, some of the blockers, uh, uh, TikTok blockers in China, and then I can maybe meet with uh, uh, the activists in here because some of them are very articulated. Some I know one of them is a 35 million follower with uh, 1 billion likes so far. These are the people we should meet. And I think uh, we also understand that the struggle is a uh, dynamic. In this country, because of racism, because of all this uh, uh, China phobia, I've been constantly attacked. I've had, the, in the past, I've been uh, attacked in this country with some really credible institution, a th death threat. And the latest on Xinjiang issue, I also has been attacked by some NED sponsor groups that very really seriously credible threat against me and or my organization. So that is a mean that we need to work together because not only the, the latest struggles the Palestinian struggles, the, the institution fight against the, the power, fight against the Palestinian organization, but also Chinese Americans and all other people of color organizations. That's the truth. So uh, at the end, thank you. Thank you. At the end, I want to say a message. Uh, repeat after me. Uh, the Chinese public, you don't need. Uh, if you cannot say the Chinese, you don't need to worry about the Chinese parliament message. 世界人民大团结万岁. That I, I know most people cannot say, but uh, the next words, what that translate into English is, uh, "People of the world united will never be defeated. People of the world united will never be defeated." Thank you. Thank you, Lee Su Hin. And I want to say, in introducing each one of these speakers today, you know, we're instructed just to give one line, and yet, you know, really each of them deserve so much uh, in terms of describing their work. KJ No, I'm so glad he was able to join us here today, flew in early this morning uh, with the Veterans for Peace, the Pivot to Peace. He is an analyst 
a journalist, a researcher, who really has done just so much in all of his work to explain the growing contradiction, conflict, uh, aggressive U.S. stand throughout East Asia. So, K.J. Noel. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Uh, usually when I address an audience like this, I try to do something a little bit different. Uh, I usually try and sneak into the room ahead of time, and I pull a little piece of paper under every chair, and I ask everybody to pull up the chair and read it. Uh, and if I did that today, it would be the entire session. It would take too much time. But essentially, those uh, papers would be the names of U.S. bases. And as we have said before, you know, there are over 800 U.S. bases around the world, and at least 300 named bases surrounding China, probably close to 400. That is to say, every single chair in this room, every single person, if you will indulge the analogy, if you were a base, you would be surrounding this group. Imagine this group is China, then you would be surrounding completely, uh, it would be completely surrounded with bases. So then the next question becomes, how did China put its bases, put its country so close to our bases? <laughs> and that, in essence, is the, uh, is the core of the issue. Why is the United States encircling China with bases? The answer is very simple. It is preparing for war. And it's not a hypothetical. It's very real. It's very concrete. The plans are very, very advanced. The US has named dates. Admiral Minahan said 2025. Um, Admiral Davidson said 2027. But the question is not if, but when. And how. How has been planned out at least since 2009. Does anybody know air land battle? Okay. Air land battle was the doctrine of war against the Soviet Union. Most of you don't know that term unless you were in the military, but you probably know the term shock and awe. Shock and awe is the colloquial term for air land battle. Starting 2009, the United States prepared a doctrine of war against China called air-sea battle. It's the counterpart of air-land battle designed to destroy, take down China. These plans have been advanced for now 15 years. Where does air-land battle come from? It comes from Israeli war doctrine. It comes from the Yom Kippur War. Essentially the idea that you go in and you attack civilian centers massively right away. Egypt, Syria, you bomb the shit out of them. That's where that comes from. So the US has been preparing for war for 15 years now, and it's very, very advanced. And we know it's very, very advanced because there's a three-stage process that you can see anytime the U.S. goes to war. The first is information warfare. It's the subkinetic, prekinetic dimension of war. That is to say, first, you manufacture consent, you demonize the other, and also, you shut down any resistance, any criticism of the war. It's like... Before the infantry goes in, you create a no-fly zone. But before war starts, you create a no-think zone. No critical thinking. 
no resistance. You see that already. The New York Times has gone after Code Pink and other organizations. Some of you may belong to them. And they have said that these people who want peace are agents of China. So we have that information war is already far advanced. The second thing the US does is it shapes the environment for war. Always does that. Before it went into Iraq, starved and tortured Iraq for 10 years until it was a broken state. And then it went in and bombed the shit out of it. Same thing right now. We see the shaping of the environment. What does that look like? Creating military alliances. AUKUS, JACUS, JAFUS, NATO Plus, QUAD, military exercises nonstop in Korea alone. 200 days of military exercises in the past year with 20 nuclear strategic bombing rehearsals. You also see uh, the pre-positioning of material and troops. So they're loading up the entire first island chain with missiles and agile, deployable, uh, island-hopping troops. There are troops on Jinmen Island, it's one of the islands that belongs to Taiwan province. Jinmen Island is two miles from the Chinese mainland. You could do a lazy backstroke and still reach China and not be tired. It's that close. They're literally saying to China, you are not even going to get out of the end zone. The tripwire is right up against your nose. You're not even going to get the ball into the court. This is how in your face the US is. And so you have all of these preparations, the shaping of the environment. You have Link 16, which is the tactical data network that connects all the foreign forces, the US forces, with every other, other US ally and prepares them for war so that they have a common tactical operational picture. And the US refers to this as a trans national kill chain. That is what is being prepared. And then the last thing is the constant provocation. I don't have to tell you what those provocations are, but they're constant and non-stop non because they want to provoke a war so that they can wrong foot and then everybody can pile on. So we are very, very, very close to war. What can we do about it? First thing to understand that there are key domains of war that are battle domains. One of them is space, the second is cyberspace, the third is your own mind. Your mind is a domain of war. It's a, the mental space is one of the domains that is currently being colonized and occupied and silenced. And our job is to resist that and to make sure that they don't have that narrative dominance so that they can enable war. And then the last thing is for us to understand that this is an incredible moment in history. It's a moment where centuries of imperialism is on the verge of shifting. For centuries, we have been told that up is down, right is wrong, day is night, exploitation is freedom, war is peace, genocide is non-existent, and development is genocide. All of those things, those lies that we have been told, right now those lies are being unmasked. And we have a foundational opportunity to shift everything and to really build out a just and peaceful and dignified world for all of humanity. Thank you.
Okay, Jay, no, thank you. It's, it's gonna be hard for, a, if ever, anyone has a pain in the pit of your stomach after this ominous warning, um, because it does what the US is backing Israel doing in Gaza. That's what they wanna do to everyone who resists them around the world. And when we think of the beautiful modern cities of China today and the high speed trains and the green cities, they wanna destroy it. There'll be workshops and panels on many of these topics this afternoon, so I'm just gonna quickly go through our schedule. Uh, we have a real grab and go lunch. That means there's some tables right outside the door. Pick up a sandwich. There's some water containers there. If there's a cafe downstairs, if you don't like the choice of sandwiches, but there's vegan and um, lots of choices um, uh, for sandwiches. But that, that is a grab and go sandwich. Uh, and then we're back here in this room where there is a, um, just as we finished lunch, Manar Adley will be joining us, who is the founder and editor of Mint Press News. Very excited she's joining us. And right after that, there are a series of workshops, four workshops at a time. There, there's rooms directly behind this wall here, over there, room two, room one, right out here in the hall. And here in, the, um, in this room here, also workshops. So we'll have the signs up so you know where each thing is, but we'll have workshops that go from 1.30 to 3. This schedule is in your book, and everyone should kind of live with this um, <laughs> book printed out. But that's from 1.30 to 3. Someone will come in and remind you. Uh, and then from 3 to 4.30, another set of four workshops. Those are really discussion groups. The panels are very short, really, to open a discussion and to have a lot of time for, for Q&A. At 4.45, we're all back in this room for the final plenary of today, which is defending our movement, confronting repression, really taking up what's happening right here in terms of attempts to shut our movement down and the resistance to it. And t this evening, at, from 6.30 to 8, there's networking, there's uh, several groups, youth group, other groups that are meeting. I know Su Hin Lee is, is showing a couple of his films here. There's some exhibits. We hope you'll really take time to look at the different literature tables. Uh, and that's all uh, for this evening, uh, from 6.30 till 8 or a little bit after that, however long you want to stay and talk. Um, tomorrow morning, we're back here at 9 o'clock. And I think you can all see the schedule, but the, we're going to open the day tomorrow with the workshops and then have a, a closing plenary, which I think really we talk about our points of unity, how we go forward, what are immediate struggles that we're involved in. So for right now, as I say, it's a, it's a grab and go <laughs> lunch, grab a sandwich outside, bring it on here, back here, and we're pretty much on time, kind of close, um, and we want to try to keep it on uh, close, so if we can do it in 20 minutes, that's, that's much better for us, uh, and we'll be back for the next session here with Minar Adley of Mint Press. Thank you. Thank you, Will.